And I would say if you haven't heard of Web3 before, then you've come to the right place because I'm going to talk about all of it for you. So I'm going to introduce you to the concepts too. I'm just making my screen so I can see what I'm doing. There we go. And let's share this window. Share screen window. There we go. Hooray, right, <laughs> it's working, great. Now I'm gonna just nudge that to the one side so I can see it, so I know if anything's going wrong. Because <laughs> otherwise, and I've done this before, I've been talking to myself at events that are online and just been carrying on and something's gone wrong and I had no idea, so now I'm extra cautious about it. Right, so my name is Laura Kalberg and I am an absolute sucker for punishment and so I'm gonna talk to you about Web3 and how, honestly, it creates problems where we need solutions. So Web3, if you listen to the people going on about it, is apparently the next significant era of the web. So Web 2.0 is our current era. It's typified by social networks, big platforms, all populated by a lot of user-generated content. It's your Facebooks, it's your Flickrs, it's your YouTubes apps that are on the web rather than the desktop mostly um, and the time like web 2.0 implied the existence of web 1.0 so the web before web 2.0 was essentially static it was websites with not very much dynamic fun functionality like a link was considered dynamic a form was considered dynamic Web 1.0 was more about publishing your personal sites in a web ring, um, in those kind of communities. And it was more people exploring and learning about what the potential of the web was. Web 3 was coined and stylized in 2014 by Gavin Wood, who is the co-founder of the second most popular cryptocurrency, Ethereum. And I'm gonna come back to Gavin later. He's an important figure. The Web 1.0 era, probably spanned about 15-ish years from the popularization of the web, from when people in the mainstream started using it on the computers, maybe at home, maybe at colleges or work, places like that. And then Web 2.0 became the next big thing. And it's probably been about 20 years until, like, since Web 2.0 became cool. So are we due another era? And is that era actually Web3? So Web3 itself is founded on the idea of decentralization based on blockchains. Please don't run away. Please don't be scared. I'm going to explain it, but also they sound really boring. I promise I'm going to try to not make it boring. Web 2.0 is the classic centralization that Web3 wants to get away from. So it says it does. So centralization is where big tech platforms that want you to join them, create content for them. They want you to keep consuming other people's content within their walls. Many of these platforms are free, like who's gonna pay to socialize online? And so Web 2.0's tycoons basically monetized our data, still do monetize our data, specifically the information of the people who use their platforms. And this is through profiling, which turns into advertising and generally getting a cut when they encourage you to buy some more stuff, stuff of any kind. And we're stuck using them because centralization means all our friends are on these platforms, our coworkers, our employers, they're using these platforms, even our government services are using these big platforms. And centralization also means that all of this valuable personal information is kept in one central database. This means there's just one location. If you want to access or hack or otherwise for nefarious purposes, get hold of the passwords that people reuse, their credit card information, or all the activities they want to keep to themselves, there's one place for you to hack. And there's also one place for governments to go to if they want to find out that information for themselves. And centralization means you don't have much say in how these platforms that consume your lives are run. Like you're just a user and you're not even usually a customer. You're just stuck with what you've got. And so if you're looking to solve the problem of centralization, 
you look to decentralization. And decentralization essentially means distributing something across many locations rather than concentrating it in one particular place. So what is Web3? Alternative forms of decentralization do exist, and this is really important to say because they will make out like this is the only way. But Web3 has specifically chosen blockchains as their means of decentralization. And a blockchain is a chain or a list or a ledger of transactions that can't be edited. And each transaction has its transaction data, a timestamp, and is cryptographically signed with a hash of the previous transaction. And the hash means you can't change the list of transactions without anybody noticing. So it's a very important part. That's the cryptographic part as well. This sort of unchangeable nature of blockchains makes them very useful for the exchange of currency. So relying on a chain's history, you can be assured that the person who wants to spend some money is the person that rightfully owns that money because the history of the blockchain will tell you so. And these currencies are called cryptocurrencies because they are built on cryptographically secured, I have to say that word really slowly because it's hard, cryptographically secured ledgers, pretty much always blockchains. They don't have to be blockchains, but they usually are. And any computer can have a copy of a blockchain, which means anyone can keep track of these types of transactions. And many copies can exist in different locations across the network. And this is what makes blockchains decentralized and other forms of decentralization use a similar structure. And if one copy is corrupted or lost or inaccessible for some reason, it doesn't mean that all of the other copies are corrupted. If something happens to one of those copies of like on that blockchain, another copy can be used to verify transactions instead. And the blockchain security increases as more machines on the network exist to verify the validity of these transactions. Inversely, if there aren't many machines on the network and somebody can control 51% of the processing power or more, they could validate a corrupted transaction. So as the, all the transactions are visible to every copy of the blockchain, all blockchain transactions are public. And the transparent nature of these transactions is why blockchains are considered verifiable. If you look up stuff about Web3, you'll see the word verifiable thrown around everywhere. So that's what that means. And that's why they're considered beneficial compared to more opaque systems where you can't necessarily see what's going on. They're considered a lot more vulnerable to corruption. So one kind of use of blockchains that could happen um, is supply chains, where any interested party could gain insight into the origin and the history of a product and where it's been. And I'll come back to the transparency of blockchains later. Another note that's just a kind of slightly random thing, when something is built using a blockchain, it is referred to as being built on the blockchain, which is confusing because it makes it sound like there's just one blockchain. And that, of course, one blockchain would just be centralized. And so when they say on the blockchain, they mean using blockchain technology. I don't understand why they make, no, I do understand why they make this deliberately hard. And we'll go into that later too. So cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, and Bitcoin is the original use of the blockchain. It's what the blockchain was actually designed around, um, is considered a way to avoid the centralized intermediaries of like banks. Um, the critical difference between a cryptocurrency and a conventional currency is that this cryptocurrency is trustless. And trustless is another word you'll see around a lot in the Web3 world. And cryptocurrencies don't just exclude traditional banks, but any kind of financial intermediary like Stripe or PayPal. The whole idea is you don't use them. And they're kind of considered a problem in, in the area because they create a barrier between you and your money and they have inefficient transfers and they require a lot of identity verification and regulation or they have to adhere to regulation. And these issues of verification and identity and generally being anti-regulation are crucial principles in the Web3 community. 
And this is why cryptocurrencies and Web3 are generally very popular with people with right libertarian beliefs. And the problem that these communities have with regulation is that the regulation of technology, it can be really slow. It can be imperfect. It's limited by the funds that the bodies are provided by their governments. And that's fair enough. And also this revolving door idea between industry and the regulators. So somebody working in an industry could next week go and work for a regulator and anyone working at a regulator could next week go and get probably a much higher job in the industry. And this is referred to as revolving doors when people do this and they take their biases and they take their interests with them. And I completely agree with these issues with regulation and especially when the regulation is from governments that could be very hostile to their population. So we all think that governments could be positive. Well, we don't all, but a lot of us think the governments could be positive until we realize what if that government was a dictator or authoritarian or something like that. So on the other hand, you might think the regulation is bad, but some of them protect us. So one of the ones that I'm familiar with because of working on the web is the GDPR, which is the General Data Protection Regulation in the EU. And whilst the GDPR is often abused and often misinterpreted and deliberately misinterpreted and horrible cookie notices are not the fault of the GDPR, they're the fault of the people implementing those horrible cookie notices, they do provide some semblance of protection for everyday people using the web. Like one good example is that the GDPR limits the amount of personal data that can be collected about a person without their consent. Like you think about the situation that we might have with these many of these platforms if that wasn't the case. And cryptocurrencies are actually regulated to some degree. Like many governments either recognize them as currencies or treat them as commodities, while the existing regulation, as with the rest of tech, is, can be pretty patchy, it's kind of inevitable, even if it's not there right now, particularly in the areas that governments are very concerned about. So if you think about your money laundering, your funding terrorism, like these are areas that governments want to get locked down quickly. And these are areas that cryptocurrencies are somewhat associated with. And much of the activity around cryptocurrencies may end up being protected under consumer rights as well. And that's important because there's an issue that is absolutely rife in cryptocurrencies known as rug pulls. And these are scams. So like having the rug pulled out from under your feet. And it's a situation where a developer often abandons their project that they've been working on a cryptocurrency or something similar, making off with usually a very high raised investment amount, um, right when the value is at its highest. And it's kind of understandably like difficult to know who to trust in this space where so much of it thrives on trustless and permissionless and anonymous. Like there's very little oversight, if any oversight at all. And especially when you might want to invest in some high value project, if you're into that kind of thing, and that could actually be a telltale sign that that project is a scam and that somebody's about to pull the rug out from under your feet. So regulation alone is not enough. Like it's often hard to enforce, especially within the huge mass that is the web with new things coming up every day. And that's where we really need to talk about standards and ethics. Like as people who use the web to build products and services for others, we really have to have a responsibility for the impact of our work. So cryptocurrencies are not an optional extra in Web3. They are the entire economic underpinning of Web3. And you'll find this referred to as being the token economy or the crypto economic protocol. Try saying that three times fast. And these terms might sound quite fancy and formal, but they're basically just using tokens. And those tokens are usually in the form of cryptocurrencies and they are used as a financial incentive for developing and maintaining 
and participating in Web3 projects. So you can even offer up your machine just as a server and get tokens in exchange for that. So you just get some tokens in response for participating. And these tokens can operate like shares. So they can create your own like ownership stake in an organization or in an app. And that could give you a more significant say in the direction of the app or in the direction of the organization. And because these tokens are stored on the blockchain and the ownership can't be transferred without your say, without your verification, nobody can take your tokens away from you. And this is something that people really care about in a world where they often end up on Web 2.0 platforms where perhaps they get kicked off, they get banned, they're not allowed on. So no one can take their participation away from them in Web3. And they cite this token economy as being uniquely democratic and egalitarian for all of these reasons. Now, Reddit is already using tokens for its community points cryptocurrency, which is built on Ethereum. And subreddits, which are Reddit subforums, if you are not into Reddit, they can create tokens to reward the participation of the people in the community. So maybe based on how many upvotes a person gets, uh, they can get tokens for that. And Reddit was already encouraging participation through upvoting. So it kind of does make sense that they just move this on to use tokens as more of a financial incentive. They're just incentivizing people to participate in their business and get more users on and raise the value of their business. It all sounds very Web3 ish until you think about the fact that Reddit is a centralized platform itself. It has a board of directors and it is owned by Condé Nast, which is a massive conglomerate. So it's hardly part of the Web3 decentralization dream. The Web3 community, like the whole token economy thing, focuses on the organizational structure of DAOs, which are decentralized autonomous organizations, and DAPs, which are decentralized apps. So let's go into DAOs first. And the concept of a DAO was uh, developed by another Ethereum co-founder, Vitalik Buterin. And DAOs are organizations that theoretically anybody can join. They have a flat hierarchy where tokens are used for governance and to vote on decisions for the organization, influence the direction of the organization too. And each DAO can have its own structure, whatever structure it likes, and rules for how it operates. And these rules are hosted on the blockchain in the form of what's called a smart contract. And so that's how they ensure that everyone keeps sticking to the rules of the smart contract in the organization. So you could kind of liken a DAO to a company run entirely by its shareholders, except that it's not a legally recognized company. And DAOs are really primarily used for like projects rather than companies, maybe more similar to like Open Collective, if you're familiar with Open Collective. And these Web3 fans, they love to talk about how DAOs are the most democratic way to run communities and organizations. I'd like to give you a fun example of a DAO, not fun or funny, the Spice DAO. And they were set up to make it so that their members could collectively bid on a rare copy of this book here, which is Alejandro Hodorowsky's book about him trying to make a film of the book June. Um, and it details all his plans and it has scripts and it has like pictures and things like that. It looks like a really gorgeous book, very expensive book. And the film project itself was abandoned. So it has all that nice rarity associated with it. And they won the auction and they celebrated with this tweet. We won the auction for 2.66 million. Now our mission is to one, make the book public to the extent permitted by the law Two produce an original animated limited series inspired by the book and sell it to a streaming service. And three, support derivative projects from the community. The members of the Spy Stout fail to realize that buying a copy of a book does not give you rights to that book or the scripts inside it or any other intellectual property contained within it, even if it was a very expensive book. 
And maybe it's unfair to characterize this as part of DAOs, like the Spice DAOs mistakes are not necessary and inherent to all DAOs. But I think the story really exemplifies the naivety of many people involved in the Web3 movement. They seemingly don't understand that Web3 doesn't mean that your communities and technologies are somehow operating outside of the law and regulation, like it's some kind of digital international waters. They, especially when you're interacting with completely existing structures. And are DAOs really that different from the existing established structures anyway? So when a DAO is set up, its founding members create this smart contract and they can reserve privileges for themselves. And usually this is in the form of getting some more additional tokens for themselves compared to all of the average members. And those with the most tokens have the most power to shape the direction of the DAO. So they become de facto leaders and continuing, like many systems before them, to encourage the centralization of power. And this brings up a fantastic quote by my partner at Small Technology Foundation, Aral Balkan, who says of decentralization, it's not decentralization unless you decenter yourself. Otherwise, you're attracting centralization to yourself if you want to hang on to power. DApps, as I mentioned before, are these decentralized apps that run on the blockchain. And as with any kind of app ecosystem, they could be any kind of app. They can have whatever whatever we have in other apps today. DApps could be the same thing. But their like purported benefit is the decentralization aspect of it. And the app and all of its data is stored on each of its users' machines. So that's how it's distributed. And with other blockchain technologies, the benefits, the decentralization, the security, it's kind of based on the participation of many users, lots of people using it. And if enough users are using this DAP, then it should have no downtime compared to centralized apps. Um, if one copy goes down, another copy will be available if something goes offline. And another suggested benefit of these DAPs is that they might be censorship resistant. So governments and other authorities can't necessarily monitor or control the activity of its users. So this is a list of um, the state of the DAPs, which is basically a big old list of all the DAPs. And this is like a leaderboard and it's currently, I've got it organized by users. And essentially, as you can see, it is mostly cryptocurrency exchanges, cryptocurrency services, games to earn cryptocurrency, apps to gamble cryptocurrency, and NFTs. And I may have just screenshotted the top part of the page there, but trust me, you keep scrolling, it's the same story over and over again. So if the current marketplace of dApps was compared to a shopping mall, it would be a mall full of banks, bureau de change, betting shops, gambling arcades. It's not exactly a delightful vision of the future. And my shopping mall comparison might be a bit of a joke, but the driving forces behind a system are consequential. They, would the web exist as it does today if it weren't for people sharing their knowledge and skills without anticipating financial reward? Like, what happens if the apps that we build and designed like, are designed just around trying to make as much currency as possible? Like, how has the collection of data affect the design and development of the apps we have on Web 2.0 platforms? And how does that affect the character of what we make? Like, how does it shape the experiences we create for the users? And arguably, like the overall economic system that Web3 is following, this financial incentivizing of everything, it exists within capitalism. This is just kind of what capitalism is. It's focused on financial reward as your incentive. So I guess it makes sense that Web3 follows along its path. But regardless of the economic systems, there is a substantial environmental issue with cryptocurrencies that is completely unsolved and it is already impacting our planet at an extraordinary rate. So we have to bear in mind that the web already isn't great for the environment. Like our digital network technology is 
it uses a lot of energy. So this is a, a comparison site that talks about the consumption of energy in a comparable way. And as you can see from these bubbles here, that data centers and data networks combined, they consume more energy than the cement industry and the copper industry, and almost as much as the paper and pulp industry. And you see that BTC, the little red BTC bubble there? That's Bitcoin. The central environment issue with most blockchains is the mechanism that is used to sign the transactions cryptographically. This is the proof of work. This is the element that makes the chain secure. And the proof of work is where multiple computers compete in computational effort. And so the concept was designed as a security measure. The entire point of it is that it requires a certain amount of computational effort. So this is a significant amount of energy and CPU power just to verify transactions. And the whole point of this mechanism was to deter people from manipulating data because it became too expensive. You didn't have the hardware to actually compete to actually be it worth the bother of trying to manipulate that data in the first place. And the process of creating this proof of work is also known as mining. And a miner can create new transactions and thus generate cryptocurrency. So it is like something mining for gold. And I think miners are a very apt name for the creation of cryptocurrencies because they do have, as we saw, a comparable environmental impact to some mining industries. So hashtag not all blockchains, not all blockchains use proof of work mechanisms. There is a mechanism called proof of stake, which requires less energy, still requires energy, but less. But at the time of this talk, like when I was reading up and trying to see what the latest was, the use of proof of stake is absolutely minimal. Ethereum have promised that they're going to move to proof of stake, but they keep postponing it. It hasn't happened yet. And the use of proof of work mechanisms in blockchains mean that they're mostly incredibly detrimental to our environment because of their energy use and the resulting like, emissions from the production of energy used to power them. The two most popular cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin and Ethereum, are estimated to use as much energy per year as small countries' total energy consumption. Now, a lot of people will say that this is a flawed way of comparing like cryptocurrencies to countries. Some countries have very low energy consumption compared to other countries. But a country is still a big place. <laughs> it's still a lot of energy. And many of these mines uh, for mining cryptocurrencies are actually based in China, which heavily relies on coal for energy. And so right now, cryptocurrencies are absolutely certainly increasing the rate at which our planet will become completely uninhabitable. It is, there's not even a debate there, it's a fact. There could be a theoretical argument, and trust me, this one gets tried a lot, that cryptocurrencies could be beneficial to the environment. But this is very much based on if they only used clean energy, and because they were such a user of clean energy that they encouraged more clean energy to be produced and more facilities for producing clean energy to be built. But cryptocurrencies actually using clean energy? Very hard to find. Very, very hard to find. And let's be honest, the hope for clean energy isn't what's making people invest in cryptocurrencies. People are just trying to make money. We call it like it is. People are just trying to make money. And the primary benefit of cryptocurrencies is you get into a currency at a nice early stage, you're an early adopter, you reap increased financial benefits as more and more people invest in the same coin as you. And then you have a higher investment, you sell out, you make a load of money from it. Which unfortunately brings me to the topic of NFTs. So NFTs are non-fungible tokens. So they are just a kind of cryptocurrency token that is one of a kind. And an NFT can be made for absolutely anything. It's kind of irrelevant, as you'll find out in a minute. And its value is inherent because of its one of a kind, like scarcity, even though that scarcity is kind of artificial. 
And their uniqueness means that they're often used for virtual objects like digital artwork. But as an owner of an NFT, you don't actually own the image of the artwork. You don't own its copyright either. Now, as people who are familiar with the web, you know that if there's an image, you could just copy and share it anyway. Um, but the NFTs for digital assets don't include the digital assets themselves. It's far too expensive to include images in a blockchain transaction. That would be way more computationally expensive than another type of transaction. These assets aren't even cryptographically signed, though. There isn't even any kind of digital watermark or anything like that. So if you buy an NFT, you own a certificate that contains a URL to your asset. And unless you own the domain and the hosting behind that URL, technically somebody else actually holds and owns the asset. And you don't have any control over that URL. You don't have any control over your asset. And somebody else could very easily change the URL and the server could be taken down. You've lost complete access to your asset. Like, you never really had it in the first place. And in theory, NFTs, and this sounds like such a nice idea, they could be used to financially reward digital artists, the kind of people who find it very difficult to monetize their art in a world where their work is so easily copied. The people who really benefit from NFTs are the people who register the NFTs in the first place, the people who pick up an image and say, I'm registering this as an NFT. And often those who are doing that are literally just grifters. And I'm not just sagging them off. They're people who actually make money from somebody else's artwork, somebody else's nice sounding song. They think, oh, that looks nice. I'll make an NFT out of it, even if they had nothing to do with it in the first place. Last year, an artist who creates these beautiful illustrations found more than 100 NFTs made from her artwork on OpenSea, which is a very popular marketplace for NFTs. You, in fact, you might have uh, seen it earlier. It's one of the top dApps, of course. She didn't list any of those herself. Somebody else was making a huge amount of money of listing, registering NFTs for her artwork. In reality, investing in an NFT is like buying the $999 I Am Rich app on the App Store. I don't know if you remember this app. You bought it and it just shined a glowing gem that said, I am rich. You've paid for bragging rights. Not much else. Especially while NFTs are getting a bit of hype and excitement and people don't really understand them. Maybe you'll be able to sell your bragging rights to somebody else, but they are that just bragging rights. And NFTs are really emblematic of cryptocurrencies as a whole. The benefits come from getting in early and building hype to raise up the value of your stake. Much like a pyramid scheme or a Ponzi scheme structure, the value is inflated as the system scales to more people. And the wealth usually ends up concentrated in the hands of the people who got in early. So Web3 certainly isn't decentralizing wealth. As Web3 is like, focused on cryptocurrency, it obviously makes sense that with these financial incentives, your decentralized identity, as they call it, is your wallet. So some web browsers, like Brave, they come with cryptocurrency wallets built in. Some browsers have extensions so that you can have your cryptocurrency wallet in your browser. And you can host your own wallet if you want, if you have the technical knowledge and the skills and the time, but it has to be hosted and secured by you. So if you forget your password, no more access to your cryptocurrency. I mean, that's a general rule of all wallets, but especially if you're hosting it yourself, it's extra trouble. Understandably, most people opt for a wallet hosted by an intermediary, and they look after your cryptocurrency on your behalf. Oh, it's nothing like banks or PayPal or anything like that. Don't be silly. So unlike physical wallets, cryptocurrency wallet doesn't actually store the currency itself. That's stored on the blockchain. Instead, the wallet is used to keep your keys. And every wallet has a unique pair of keys. They're a bit like addresses. And one is private and the other is public. And the private key is used to verify transactions on your behalf. 
and the public key is used as an address so that people know where to send cryptocurrency when they want to send it to you. So once you've got your wallet, you can use it as your identity with any compatible, like compatible Web3, DAO or DAP. That means you don't need to use OAuth, you don't need to sign up, you don't need to log in, you just rock on up with your crypto wallet. And that's what Web3 folks mean when they say permissionless. And you can keep your wallet identity private and anonymously participate in the Web3 community without sharing your address with anyone. But if you want to receive any cryptocurrency, you need to provide your public key address. And if a person or an organization has access to your address, then they can see all of your transactions and how much currency is in your possession. Because that's what we were saying earlier about the blockchain transparency. This is the flip side of that transparency. You have no privacy around your transactions unless you sign up for some kind of crypto wallet that adds like an intermediary that adds an extra layer of privacy protection on top. Now, if you've been on the receiving end of harassment and abuse online, you probably have alarm bells going off in your head right now and for a good reason. As Molly Wright wrote in uh, her uh, she wrote about wallets in her post about harassment and abuse on the blockchain. Imagine if, when you Venmoed your Tinder date for your half of the meal, they could now see every other transaction you've ever made. And not just on Venmo, but the ones you made with your credit card, bank transfer, or other apps, and with no option to set the visibility of the transfer to private. The split checks with all of your previous Tinder dates that monthly transfer to your therapist, the debts you're paying off or not, the charities to which you're donating or not, the retirement, the account amount you're putting in a retirement account or not. The location of that corner store right by your apartment where you so frequently go to grab a pint of ice cream at 10 p.m. Not only would this all be visible to that one off Tinder date, but also to your ex-partners, your estranged family members, your prospective employers. An abusive partner could trivially see you siphoning funds to an account they can't control as you prepare to leave them. And as for the marketing machines and predictive algorithms that currently suck in every scrap of data they can to determine what ads to show you or evaluate your suitability for a mortgage or try to predict if you'll commit a crime, well, they've just hit the jackpot. So there is a solution for this and the lack of privacy in cryptocurrencies in general, and that is to have multiple wallets. And this is actually something that the community tends to recommend for security policies. They call it like uh, hot wallets and cold wallets. And you keep most of your transactions in an unshared wallet. But how easy is it to keep track of multiple wallets? Like, it's hard enough having the responsibility for one set of passwords. Like, you have to include who has access to which wallet, which wallet to use for each different type of occasion, different type of activity. Like, that is not a workable solution for most of the pop like population. Certainly not for people without any technical knowledge or technical background. And the permanence of the blockchain means that a record is kept of every transaction. So you can't get rid of it either. Any terrible item that's shared using the blockchain is stored on that blockchain forever. So when we're talking about things like revenge porn, child abuse images, hate speech, harassment, all of it on the blockchain forever. Now, some forms of moderation are possible on the blockchain. Platforms built on the blockchain can choose not to display a transaction. They can just hide it. But that hidden transaction is still visible on the other copies of the blockchain in the system. We do need better transparency and permanent records in many areas of society, especially if we want to hold governments and corporations to account. The problem is that Web3 flattens hierarchies in a way that creates very little difference between an individual person, a corporation, or a government. The water first, <laughs> before I get to this next bit. Oh, blimey. So there are some aspects of Web3 I've not spoken about today. 
And the definition of Web3 and what qualifies as Web3 is kind of debatable. It depends which blog post you read, which tutorial you follow, which person you want to pay attention to. But I should mention the metaverse. So this is an extended reality consisting of 3D spaces in virtual reality where people can interact with each other, pay for everything using tokens, of course, and it's odd because networked like virtual worlds, they're not something that's new. This screenshot I've got here is actually from Second Life. Second Life started 19 years ago, already has its own marketplace, already has its own virtual currency. I mean, its virtual currency can only be used in Second Life, but it's not built on the blockchain. And what's probably the most intriguing about the metaverse, and when I say intriguing, I mean absolutely horrifying, is how interested Facebook is in this space. Like, the metaverse is why Facebook changed its name to Meta. It's creating its own metaverse that will be like living inside Facebook, which is just such a scary idea. <laughs> it's odd though, because the decentralized principles of Web3 and Facebook seem like a complete mismatch. Like, Facebook is classic Web 2.0. When you consider how much Facebook has profited from being that centralized platform, that inescapable centralized platform, it makes you question if these people are interested in Web3, who actually gains from Web3? So Web3 is really popular with developers, and this is what a lot of us are hearing. Aside from the NFT side of things, the people mostly talking about Web3 are developers. And I kind of get that. Like, if you're into development, if you're into creating things for the web, it's easy to understand why you might be excited about trying out a new technology that could make you some money and you get to build on a new system. But they're not the only people who are benefiting from Web3. If you've heard people in the web community constantly bitching about hexagons and be like, what if they suddenly got against a shape? It's because they're lamenting Twitter. And so these NFT profile pictures that Twitter lets you have if you sign up for their Twitter blue with your crypto wallet, uh, you can use your NFT as your profile picture. And it's differentiated from a non-NFT profile picture by a soft hexagon. It's like slightly rounded corners hexagon as compared to the circular profile picture that the rest of us have. Now. It's kind of like Reddit's use of tokens. Like Twitter, they're implementing NFT profile pictures. It's not decentralization. It's not even on the blockchain. It's kind of brushing up against the blockchain. We're not actually being involved in it at all. And Twitter is absolutely exemplary of these companies who are implementing or embedding Web3 technologies. They're just using the wave of the hype around this buzzword on top of their own popularity and the scale that they already have, and often they struggle to monetize what they're building itself, to cash in with a group of people who are so willing to spend money just to get bragging rights. The excitement that venture capitalists share with like about Web3 is also incredibly suspicious. Like These are the same people who invested in Web 2.0 platforms and profited from centralization. Like they like to keep users where their firms are making money. Decentralization, that is not it. Like Andresine Horowitz, which is a venture capital firm, they recently announced a $4.5 billion fund for projects around blockchain and Web3. Like, they've already invested in OpenSea, Coinbase, another very big popular like, marketplace situation for cryptocurrencies. But venture capital, they make their money back from and they make their money from the fact they have such a huge amount of ownership. They want centralized control. So that's not decentralized power. And as with any kind of investment, like the early adopters of cryptocurrencies benefit the most. It's like what I mentioned earlier. And the more hype that's around Web3, including the noise that's on social media and the people debating its significance, the easier it is to convince people to invest. Like, oh, I've heard of that thing. So whether it's another individual that's buying up cryptocurrency and trying to push the value up, or whether it's getting the attention of these big venture capital firms who will pump more money into your Web3 initiative, it's the hype machine. 
The hype machine is the money machine. And that is why you are hearing so much about Web3. Now, I hate the whole thing about blaming the victim. I think there is absolutely nothing wrong with wanting a fairer alternative than the world we currently live in. Like, I don't blame people who are suffering under the current system, who want to go and use cryptocurrencies and NFTs as a way to get themselves out of a struggle for existence. But to paint Web3 as this route to democratic and egalitarian society is absolutely ridiculous. Like, at best, you could be perceived as a bit naive, but at worst, you're conveniently hyping an initiative where you stand to gain significant wealth as a direct result of your hype. And we do need decentralization. We need to get away from big tech. And blockchain could have some practical, like cryptocurrency free, that being the important part, applications for holding corporations and maybe governments to account. But you cannot escape the environmental impact when your structure is entirely reliant on the proof of work blockchains and cryptocurrency. And it bears repeating. If participation is your route to financial compensation, Web3 will still encourage the centralization of power. And who has that power? But this brings me to another fundamental flaw in the Web3 community. It's the community itself. Like, I don't see how this community is any different from those who built the centralized platforms of Web 2.0. They're primarily white, young, cis, non-disabled men, and I have nothing against those people, except when they are an entire group, they build things in their image. They're the same people who were happy to exploit and monetize others under Web 2.0, just for the sake of building wealth for themselves. And they're the people who are most able to build within the complexities of Web3, because Web3 is not inclusive. Participation in Web3 requires so much knowledge. You need to understand the concepts and the space, and not even just to build on them, but to just protect yourself and your privacy and your security in the first place, to avoid scammers, the amount you have to learn about it. And few people in the community are actually bothering to try to make Web3 accessible to others, I mean, they're benefiting as early adopters. The DAOs and the DAPs are not being made accessible to everyday people who don't have technical knowledge. And at the beginning of this talk, I said I had come back to Gavin Wood, the guy who came up with the Web3 term. So when Gavin was pressed on this high barrier to entry for using Web3, this is what he said. There's a big difference between having a right or freedom that you could execute if you had bothered educating yourself well enough and the inability at a very basic and fundamental level of doing something because you lack the inclusion in an exclusive group. If I educate myself well enough on material that's freely available and that's all that is to require to become a co-provider of the service, then that is a free service. So what Gavin Wood is saying there is everyone has equal access to Web3. And if you find it too difficult, that's because you're too lazy to be bothered to learn. And this is probably considered a perfectly reasonable example, like a reasonable thing to say. If you're the kind of person who has a lot of wealth in terms of money and in time, like if a new technology requires a lot of time, a lot of resources, existing knowledge to participate, it will inevitably reproduce the same power imbalances as we already see in technology today. Except maybe more developers will be kings. Your movement is not egalitarian when only those who have free time, probably those who are supported by secure, high paying jobs already, few dependents, have the time to learn the required knowledge, develop the skills to participate, or have the currency to be able to buy their way in or have the hardware to generate the computational power. Making your resources inclusive to everyone has to be part of the plan for creating new technology. Otherwise, your talk of creating a more egalitarian society becomes nothing more than a justification for environmental destruction. You don't care about everyone participating in this technology. You just care about you being able to participate. And the same applies to community ownership. Like having your technology be owned by the community is a very noble goal, 
that community has to be accessible and inclusive. Otherwise, you just get reproductions of the existing toxic communities that we have all over the place in Web 2.0, led by those who, of course, have the time and the resources to participate. And a toxic community is a red flag. And I have to be really honest with you, I didn't want, I was kind of split on whether I wanted to give this talk today at all talked about whether it's worth making it an article on smashing. I'm absolutely terrified of the blowback I'll get because I spoke at an Ethereum conference three years ago and I came back from my hotel room that night and I sobbed because I was just there to talk about how to make decentralized projects more inclusive. And the amount of people I had there just questioning whether I deserved to be there, whether I deserved a platform, the next day I woke up and people were calling me a social justice warrior on the internet. And I mean, okay, granted, that's not exactly a gotcha. Like if you say that my work is in trying to fight for the causes of social justice, I'll take that as a compliment, absolutely. And that's why I'm talking at this event about design ethics and about this very topic, because it's so important. A community that cares about being better than what came before has to be open to criticism and change. And I'll be the first to admit, as they will probably call me, a cynical old hag when it comes to technology. Like, I've been in the industry long enough that it is hard to genuinely enthuse me about new technology. And that's not because I'm nostalgic for how technology once was. Like, Web 1.0 was hardly some inclusive paradise. I just, I think there might be a better way We've just not got there yet. And I've been working at, and I've been the co-founder of not-for-profit organizations researching decentralization for like going on eight years now. And I've been immersed in communities in this area. I do know what I'm talking about. I'm biased, yes, of course, because I believe that small technologies, like the foundation's work has promise. But I don't think we're the only people that can possibly build an alternative to big tech, and that would be a very sad situation. And I'll say it again, we really do need decentralization. We need to break down the current power structures and distribute ownership to communities and to individuals rather than these massive corporations. We need to regain control over our personal information. Aurel Balkar, my partner at Small Technology Foundation, created this Web Zero manifesto because he wanted to highlight the benefits of decentralization while rejecting blockchain and NFTs and the metaverse. As people who build on the web, it's our responsibility to seek out ethical alternatives to mainstream technology. Like, sure, it's really entertaining to dunk on NFTs on social media. You might get a bunch of likes and retweets out of it, but we also have to address unethical actions with seriousness. Like, we need to use our knowledge of technology for real criticism, not be scared of criticizing these things because we could prevent scammers from taking advantage of vulnerable people. Web3 is a fun buzzword used by a group of people who believe that our use of the web will evolve into a digital land grab where you can monetize absolutely everything with the help of environment destroying technology. That's my TLDR. But let's go back to the people heralding the coming movement of Web3. I, I am wrapping up, I promise. <laughs> it's important to note that Web 1.0 was a retronym, it was only called that way after the fact, way after the time was up. And Web 2.0 was underway like a long time before anyone actually started calling it Web 2.0. Web 3 is nowhere near as popular as the floods of posts on social media suggest. It's very clever branding, I'll give them that, but it's not as inevitable as the name implies. In most implementations, Web3 isn't the revolution it claims to be. It's far more centralized. It has a lot more similarities to Web 2.0 than its defenders would care to admit. Whether you find that delusional or predatory, I'll let you decide. <laughs> and on that note, thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you.
Wow. <laughs> that was absolutely amazing. <laughs> Um, Thank you. Maybe not. I mean, I'm, my, my head's full with with thoughts and questions and um, um, kind of insights. So I thought that was that was probably the best summary of the things that I felt about Web three, but was never able to articulate. So I'm first of all extremely happy that you're 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 daring to. Uh, share that with uh, with us and our, our community. Um, so thank you very, very much for that. Um, I do kind of want to take do one or two questions now and then do a little bit more when we do the uh, the round table. Um, I, I, I think one of the one of the things before we go into questions, which I, th I thought was amazing, is that you're saying, you know, it's not as popular as you think, right? Because you're hearing so much about it, reading so much about it, etc. But then uh, I saw one of the comments in the thread. It's like, you know, uh, the amazing thing about Web three is, you know, all the conversation about it are happening on Web two, because Web three <laughs> actually hasn't built anything which is remotely good enough to 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 do it. And and the partly that's because it's, you know, maybe the space is not that big, the technology is not that great, but that, that is quite quite interesting. I, I think that the core question that I I would have, and um, which which maybe is way too difficult to to tackle, but you know, there's lots of things which clearly are very very problematic. Um, but then you're also saying you know decentralization uh, is good, and in some cases it's very good to be very transparent about things. So, in what ways do you still see use cases for things like blockchain technology? Um, is is there a use case? I do think the one use case that might work is the idea of using it for supply chains, using it to or to record histories of some kind, things where you don't want to, you want to have permanent transactions, you want to have a permanent record, you want it to not be corruptible. But as long as it's not based on the proof of work mechanism as well, because I mean, if there's not even a cryptocurrency on the blockchain, then it literally is just burning stuff to record information. And you've really got to have a good reason to do that. Yeah, that's that's absolutely fair enough. Um, but in what cases, because for example, just, just bluntly saying, I live in Hong Kong, which is kind of China. You know, there is, there is definite things about, you know, decentralization and um, uh, privacy issues here. So in what way do you think, you know, uh, is, is Web3 in any way a solution for something like that? Or, or is, is, is the, the problem way bigger than something technology can solve? Well, I think the project is huge and uh, like the problem is huge and difficult for technology to solve. I don't think it's impossible. And I do actually think the decentralization and I do think that it's a very good use case when you're talking about authoritarian governments, places where you wouldn't necessarily want to have the government knowing everything you're doing. It's not that you are doing anything wrong. And I think that privacy is about choosing what you want to share. It is not about hiding things. And that is a situation where I think it is important. And decentralization can offer that. The idea of having peer-to-peer um, -peer encrypted communications, like, that is a great idea for decentralization. And this is one of the things that I really wanted to put across is that you can have decentralization without blockchains and without cryptocurrencies. And there are many people like investigating different types of solutions around this. And so to act like blockchain is the only way of doing it is, is not true. Yeah, <laughs> tell the rest of the world that. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a problem that when yeah. you hear about one one solution that's going to make you a lot of money, suddenly everything becomes solvable by that solution that makes you a lot of money. Yeah, and 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 one of the things which which I'm seeing very much in my in my client work is that you know every you know mid-sized company now wants to jump on the bandwagon because they're afraid to to miss. So kind of uh, what what's happened previously as well, and some of those technologies cheated out and some of them became big, but everyone's so afraid to, to miss the next big thing. And it's just, it feels quite often as a bit of a, a red race towards something, well, what? 
Yeah, and they also really benefit from the fact that it's complicated. The language is complicated, the technology is complicated, and they're not trying to make it easier for people to understand. And because then it becomes a situation of if you don't understand it, you're too stupid to understand it. And nobody wants to be seen as stupid. So people will sign up for blockchain projects that are completely irrelevant to what their business is doing just because they don't want to be left out or seen as stupid. Yeah. Yeah. And and yeah, that's the the the, the kind of the, the shaming, the naming and shaming in a in a in a very negative way. Anyway, I, 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 if it's okay with you, I want to wrap this up. There is plenty more yeah. questions, which I have. I've seen some other questions in the chat. We've run a little bit late. So um, if it's okay with everyone, let's do a five minute break uh, for everyone to, you know, uh, uh, get freshened up, go to the toilet, get some fresh coffee, whatever. And then um, we'll, uh, we'll see you back in about five minutes when we're continuing with Trina. And before we go, Please, everyone in the chat, and let me let me play the Vitaly now. Do some clap emojis for Laura. 